Meanwhile, if you will join me in the prayer for illumination that is printed in the bulletin, let us pray. Holy God, you search us out and know us better than we know ourselves. Speak your word to us with clarity and grace and true compassion. May we absorb what you would have us learn today. We pray to honor Jesus' name. Amen. The scripture reading for today is from Mark's Gospel, chapter 5, verses 21 through 43. This I will be reading from the New Living Translation. As I was going through my sermon series on the Lord's Prayer earlier this summer, this was the, uh, um, this, the lectionary passage for June 27th. So I skipped it in June, and it's coming back today. And next week, we're going back to looking specifically at Mark. Um, but in the meanwhile, this is chapter 5, verses 21 through 43. Jesus got into the boat again and went back to the other side of the lake where a large crowd gathered around him on the shore. Then the leader of the local synagogue, whose name was Jairus, arrived. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, pleading fervently with him. My little daughter is dying, he said. Please come and lay your hands on her. Heal her so she can live. Jesus went with him, and all the people followed, crowding around him. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She had suffered a great deal from many doctors, and over the years she had spent everything she had to pay them, but she had gotten no better. In fact, she'd gotten worse. She had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe. For she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Immediately, the bleeding stopped, and she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out for him, so he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my robe? His disciples said to him, look at this crowd pressing around you. How can you ask, who touched me? But he kept on looking around to see who had done it. Then the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, came and fell to her knees in front of him and told him, what she had done. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. While he was still speaking to her, messengers arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. They told him, Your daughter is dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. But Jesus overheard them, and he said to Jairus, Don't be afraid. Just have faith. Then Jesus stopped the crowd and wouldn't let anyone go with him except Peter, James, and John. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw how much commotion and weeping and wailing. He went inside and asked, Why? this commotion and weeping. The child isn't dead. She's only asleep. The crowd laughed at him. But he made them all leave, and he took the girl's father and mother and his three disciples into the room where the girl was lying. Holding her hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And the girl who was 12 years old immediately stood and walked around. They were overwhelmed and totally amazed. Jesus gave them strict orders not to tell anyone what had happened, and then he told them, give her something to eat. This is the word of the Lord, and thanks be to God. So 
So for the last three Sundays, I've been doing sort of a mini-series based on some of the work of John Vandelar, a pastor in South Africa, who wrote a book, uh, a sermon series called Your Inner Essence, about the way the spirit lives and moves in each of us and how that uh, can supplement our lives, give us nourishment, give us what we need in our living for every day. The first week, we talked about how the Spirit encourages us to understand that we are safe. Last week, we talked about how the Spirit encourages us to know that we are loved. And today, we're looking at how the Spirit reminds us that we are connected. As I usually do, I read through a lot of different things and I'm on a, a list of a lot of different newsletters and Diana Butler Bass, who is a, a pastor and a lecturer, has a newsletter that she sends out, I'm on the list, called The Cottage. And this week she talked about an experience she had going to New Mexico, in northwestern New Mexico, where David and I actually spent a little time three years ago. Three? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. Anyway, it's, <laughs> she was traveling specifically to a community that she had wanted to see, is near Taos. And the community itself, the name of which I forget because I forgot to write it down, um, is kind of up in, in the, a mountainous region. And she discovered as they were heading there, she'd never been there before, but she was with some people who knew about it and they said, let's go. She said, okay. As they got there, she discovered that the road that led up was kind of twisty and whiny, windy and narrow and without guardrails. And the community itself was like right on the edge of, of a cliff where, you know, drop. And she discovered she was really afraid of heights. Um, she discovered she had a fear of the edge. And if you've ever been in places where things are high, um, the edge is, it's, it's a boundary that you really don't want to cross. Uh, I was watching a, 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 some videos and there was this guy, I, I'm not sure exactly where he was, it looked like he may have been in England, you know, those really high cliffs in Dover that have just a sheer drop down to the Atlantic, he was on his stomach crawling to the edge because his wife was encouraging him to get over his fear. And so he was on his stomach laughing like a loon because he was terrified and peeked over the edge. So we've all been in, in that, I mean, the edge is scary, is scary. And we've all been on edge and we've been on the edge for a long time now. We've had 18 months of a pandemic, hospitals overflowing, and now even children are getting sick. Anti-vaxxers and anti-maskers are driving health policy in some states. The climate report, Code Red for Humanity, revealed some horrible data affirmed by the first recorded rain on the Greenland ice cap. That's not good news. The Taliban is marching across Afghanistan for the first time in 20 years, and women and children are fleeing, fearful of, for their fundamental, of, fearful of their fundamentalist advance. There's an earthquake in Haiti, there's hurricanes, drought, and flooding. We are all on edge. We are all at the edge. There is no denying that. Yet, we're also all still connected. Let's look at how these realities of being on the edge and being connected play out in this story from Mark's gospel. Like last week, we have two different people in the story. Each has her own dire health needs and Jesus is seen as the one who has the power to make a change for them. For the 12 year old girl, the request for healing comes through her father who is a leader in the community, and for the woman who is destitute because of her health, the only one who will take up her case is her own gumption and her own determination to finally be healed when she hears that Jesus, this miracle worker, has come to town. So Jairus comes, throws himself in front of Jesus' feet, and Jesus agrees to go with him to see what he can do for this man's daughter. 
And so along the way, as they're going along, and the Greek says that the crowd is, is crowding around him. In English, it's just, you know, crowding around him. The, the Greek word could also be squeezing that intense and tight. Along the way, a woman who has been bleeding and who is therefore ritually unclean and outcast from the community for as long as the child has been alive, she skulks around to where she has an opportunity to simply feel Jesus' cloak for just a moment. As I've read this story over the years, I've often tried to put myself in her place as she pushed her way toward him. I suspect that she had tunnel vision. She didn't care who was around her. She didn't care what, how people were reacting to her pushing into the crowd. The only thing she saw was this man that she had heard about. The only thing in her world was her need and her determination to touch him or at least his clothes. I assume you all have seen the pictures from the airport, that airfield in Kabul, uh, where Afghani people are pushing to be seen by those who can pluck them out of the crowd and airlift them out of the country? Have you seen this, the crush of humanity? The noise, the jostling. I think that's what the crowd around Jesus at that time must have been like that. And this woman, she's on the edge of that crowd. She's on the edge in her own life. She's got nothing left and therefore nothing to lose. She's in a very dangerous place. She's in a place where anything could happen. In continuing to talk about the edge, Diana Butler Bass says, edges are odd. There's something called edge theory in psychology. This is the drive towards survival in life-threatening situations. If one doesn't surrender to fear at the edge, people at the edges learn to cooperate in creative ways to solve problems. Edge theory in environmental science has long noted that edges are a great place of biodiversity, zones of ecological encounter, often stronger with more resilient and sustainable ecologies than other places in flat or isolated areas. The edge, she was on the edge, she was on edge and she dove in. In Greek, the word for touch, which she did with Jesus' cloak, is more aptly translated as grab, to fasten to, to adhere to, to fasten fire to a thing, to kindle. The second she grabbed Jesus' cloak, she felt in her body the healing that she had been searching 12 years to find. Her determination, her faith, propelled her forward and kindled healing when she gripped Jesus' clothes. Now, since the crowd was pushing and Jesus and Jairus and the 12 were attempting to move forward, I think the woman probably fell behind as the press of bodies continued on toward Jairus' home. Likely she just stood there, still, processing what she had felt in her body and beginning to feel as though her journey on the edge and to the edge and over the edge had not been in vain. But then Jesus stopped and he looked around, maybe even right at her, and asked, who touched my clothes? The disciples, who were probably doing their best to keep a clear path for Jesus and Jairus, being stepped on, elbowed, jostled, people yelling in their ears, looked around them incredulously. Who didn't touch you? 
they ask him. But Jesus persists. He will not budge until he finds out who touched his clothes. Terrified at what she has done to him, she has made him unclean. The woman comes forward and like Jairus, falls to her knees and confesses her whole story. In the past, I often thought that Jesus seems to be a bit overbearing in his demand. Who touched my clothes? I was working out of a mindset that was nurtured into me that even God has only so much to give. I thought that Jesus might have been looking to find out who cheated the little girl out of his healing. I've long since outgrown that understanding of God and God's mercy. Jesus could have healed everyone in that crowd, everyone in the next village over, everyone in the known world, and still been able to raise Jairus' daughter from death. He didn't ask the question to find out who snuck up and stole some of his healing power. He asked the question to find out who needed to be reconnected to her life. Because you see, her body was healed. She had what she wanted, what she had spent all her money and hopes on for 12 years. She was healthy. But she was still on the edge. Jesus knew that. So he demanded everything stop until she came to him and told him and the crowd her entire truth. Debbie Thomas, writing Journey with Jesus, says of this story, Jesus knows that this woman has been reduced to caricature shamed into silence by bad religion, denied the spiritual nourishment and empowerment. That's her birthright as a child of God. She needs someone to listen, to understand, and to bless her whole truth in the presence of a larger community. So this is what Jesus does. Even when time is of the essence and he has essential work to do elsewhere, he pauses to restore a broken woman to fellowship, dignity, and humanity. He insists that her experience is no less important than the leader of the synagogue. He doesn't allow her to slink away into obscurity. He instead pulls her forward, calls her forward to bear witness to what has happened to her, to find her voice, to speak publicly and confidently about God and what God has done. Daughter, he says to her when she finally quiets, daughter, your faith has made you well. Your suffering is over. Go in peace. Yet even as Jesus was blessing her, as even as Jesus was confirming her trust, her faith, Servants come up to Jairus with terrible news. Mark Davis at Left Behind and Loving It says, in fact, Jairus' worst nightmare seems to come true. They had waited too long, and now it's too late. It would seem that Jesus had had a choice. Rescue the girl or deal with the woman. But that is scarcity thinking. That's the way how I used to understand God's grace and mercy and healing working. In this story, Jesus heals both. That is God's abundance. Jesus overhears this information given to Jairus and ignoring everyone else, looks him right in the eye and tells him not to give in to fear, 
not to give in to grief, not to give in to anything that comes with that terrible news, but instead to have confidence in him. I read a commentary years and years and years ago that said that when Jesus comes to the house and says to the people, she's just sleeping, he was telling the truth because it was in the moment that Jairus decided to trust Jesus with his daughter, with his life, with his faith, that the girl was healed and raised from the dead. Jesus didn't even need to be there. All he needed was Jairus to trust him and she was raised. So when they get to the house and he said, she's just sleeping, she was. Jairus may be looking at that woman that he as the leader of the synagogue following the rules of purity had kept out of community for 12 years who is now healthy and whole he doesn't say anything in this story as we have it but he sees her he sees what Jesus has done he sees how Jesus has restored her and he simply continues on toward home with him when they get there Jesus throws the professional mourners and those who don't believe him when he said the child is just asleep out of the house. He takes his three inner circle disciples and her parents and he goes into the sick room. He takes her by the hand and tells her, little girl, get up. And she does. Once again, Jesus reconnects a life that was at the edge. He finishes off his healing by telling them, get her something to eat. She's been out of it for a long time. She must be hungry. I can see him still holding her hand, smiling at her as he says this. I think with this story, provides for us is an option, a choice. We need to choose whether we will be the kind of people who cling stubbornly to what we know, refusing to venture beyond the safety of accepted wisdom, refusing to even consider that there is an edge, or be those who embrace the way the Spirit moves in and among us, because the Spirit always requires that we journey together to see each other as dearly loved by the same God who made us and holds us. You may have seen another picture taken in Afghanistan this week. It is the interior of a C-17A Globemaster III cargo plane that was flown into Kabul to help with the evacuation. It's full of people, full, crammed in, not an inch of space with all those people sitting on the floor of the plane. The crew of the plane, having flown into Kabul, seeing the great crush of people, knew there was a great need. And so the crew made a decision. They made a decision to step into the edge, step over the edge. Cameron Trimble, who uh, writes at Piloting Faith, she is also a pilot, and so she knows some things about re air regulation. She says, believing their first objective and priority was to save human lives, they broke every protocol imaginable and filled that plane with 640 passengers. And if you look at that picture, you see none of them are strapped in. None of them have probably been given those pre-flight instructions about where your flotation device is and the, air, the oxygen mask coming down out of the ceiling. The crew just ushered them in, got as many people in as they could, breaking all kinds of rules the same way Jesus did. And they said in a later interview that they just knew that they needed to get those people safely in the air. They'd figure out what they'd do with them later. Cameron Trimble goes on to say the crew never should have been in that position. 
Afghan civilians should never have been in that position. None of this should have ever happened. But it gives me great hope to see that even in these conditions, human goodness prevailed. She goes on to say, if we learn anything as a country, as a global community, I hope we learn our human plights are connected. In a small world, we are each other's keepers. We must take particular care of one another. Peace will only be achieved when we finally accept that that has always been the need. We are on edge these days, no doubt about it. And we are not the first to be so. And if human history shows us anything, we won't be the last. The witness of scripture and the movement of the spirit reveals to us that while we may find our times hard pressed, three things are true. We are safe. We are loved. We are connected. Thanks be to God who saves, loves, and connects us through the life, death, and resurrection of his son, Jesus. Through his love and willingness to sacrifice his life for ours, we need not be frightened, and we can have every reason to be filled with confident trust. May it be so. Amen.